Good morning. My name's Terry O'Donoghue, and I have a story to tell. I want you to remember that this is an African story, and in context, some of the approaches that may sound strange to you do make sense. Remember, we are talking about an economy where the official unemployment rate is 25%. The actual rate is probably in excess of 30%. And when you talk specifically about the youth under 25 years old, the estimate is for over 60% unemployment. If I was to try and summarize this presentation, I tell you it's all in the book and it works. More conventionally, um, I'll give you some background. You have to have some context to understand what we're doing. Touch on the hypothesis we were testing. Look at the results we got, but more importantly, what we did. And specifically in four areas. What we did on alignment, in the service department, vehicle prep, and vehicle sales. What we learned doing it, what we didn't get right, and then some measures and evaluations. It was always a challenge in activist circles in the 80s that whenever someone got up to speak, they would have to answer the question, who gave you your mandate? Or in other words, why should we be listening to you? So from habit, if nothing else, I'll give you some background. I spent 30 years at Toyota South Africa. And it's not so much the years I spent there in the various divisions which included IT, finance, marketing, production, distribution, and after sales but it was the timing of those years. Toyota South Africa started in 1963, importing stouts, and by 1967 had begun local manufacture. It was owned and run by the Vessels family. By 1980, which is the year I joined, they'd reached the number one position in market share. This is a position they've held unbroken since then, and they'll reach 35 years market leadership this year. With the success came a certain hubris. At the peak, the market share touched 27%. And we were very comfortable in a protected market between 125% import duty. The motor industry was seen as a key part of the government's industrialization development program. And although we were wholly South African owned, we were a Toyota factory, and very much better than any of the other factories run by the other major brands in South Africa at the time, being VW, Ford, GM, Nissan, Mercedes, and BMW. We understood TPS, old Lionel ran regular courses, and we had an impressive Japanese vocabulary. We also knew our catechism well. By the late 80s, we were producing 100,000 vehicles per annum and clearly outperforming our rivals on almost every measure. That changed radically in the early 90s for a number of reasons. With the internal settlement in South Africa and the end of isolation, the national manufacturing orientation changed from one of import substitution to one of export-led growth. Import duties were reduced from 125% to 17% over a seven-year period, and with the export incentives could be effectively zero. From being a very protected market with aging products, South Africa went to a very open market with all the major players arriving with the very latest technology, and especially from Korea, in a very short time. At the same time, the motor industry was going increasingly global. Scale was the critical dimension, with single drawings worldwide, high volume sourcing and specialist one model factories supplying a whole hemisphere's demand. It was very clear that Toyota South Africa could not survive these challenges as an independent producer. The only way to survive was to be able to export. And in order to export, we had to be part of the Toyota global supply chain. In 1996, TMC bought 27% of the shares, and in 2002, increased this to 75%. To be part of the Toyota global supply chain, you had to be owned by TMC. With this purchase came the evaluation, and the harsh reality was that we weren't a very good Toyota factory. The quality was poor, the delivery performance unreliable, the cost structures way out of line, and it didn't matter that we were the best in the industry in South Africa. In global terms, we were not acceptable as a supplier of Toyota products to the world market for TMC. We were given two years to get the cost structures in line and the quality measures to standard and to show we could reliably supply an export market. In typical Toyota fashion, they selected one product, Corolla, and one market, Australia, to prove the concept. 
at that time, I was the vehicle supply chain director. That was before we all morphed into vice presidents. And my responsibilities included production planning and scheduling, production control, as well as the inbound component planning and logistics and outbound distribution. This was when we all learnt about TPS and saw it for the first time. Tahara was the designated mother plant, and at one stage there were 400 hands-on specialists, mostly at a team leader level, from Tahara in Durban. The local Hilton Hotel was known as the Toyota Dormitory and still has a very extensive Japanese menu. Standardized work took on a totally different meaning, and for the first time our eyes were open to just what performance is possible if you paid more than lip service to the concepts of TPS. We moved from a multi-model, low-volume, complex plant to a two-model, high-volume, much simpler plant and reached the target standards to be able to export. This was the precursor to the IMV export to Australia to Africa and Europe with over 100 destinations and more than 40 model derivatives in left and right hand drive. At its peak in 2007, production was over 180,000. The transformation was dramatic and widespread. It included as much work and improvement with the suppliers as it did in the manufacturing facility. Marketing operations struggled to play catch up. In 2005, I moved to the after sales and customer service and took the same TPS concepts into parts warehousing and distribution and the technical support of the dealers. To me, TPS is three things. Visualization, standardization, and hijunker. Visualization to grasp the situation and identify the problems to work on. Standardization to implement the chosen countermeasures in a sustained way that ensures quality. And hijunker, the even flow to protect quality. Because if you throw enough variation at any quality system, you can break it. You could look at it another way. Hijunka is the prelude to visualization. It's only by smoothing the flow that you make visible and reveal the problems, as standard and non-standard becomes seen on the shop floor. It doesn't matter which way you see it, because it's iterative. Michael Bale criticizes you Toyota guys, can't see beyond TPS. And I'll plead guilty to that. I'm still getting to grips with TPS. I'm not worrying about what's beyond it. I retired in 2010 and happily joined the pensioner class. So what am I doing here? There's no doubt that the need to prove you are right had something to do with it. For more than five years, I'd been cajoling the dealer network to take TPS seriously and implement it at retail level. We were Toyota, for goodness sake. We were expected to do these things. TPS works, it had been proven again and again, and they could see the impact all around them. But not even the most optimistic, biased eye could I see any take up at all. So when the opportunity to work with Halfway was offered in 2011, first on a part-time basis and then as a real job in 2012, there was an element of wanting to prove a point. That TPS works, even at retail, and the challenge was to prove it. Not in a department or a dealership, but across the whole organization. The intriguing question was, can we do it at retail? Can we transform a whole organization? And can we make it sustainable? Change on this scale is about culture. And as this rather long quote from Peter Senge says, at the heart of transformation is the issue of unilateral control. I had seen the impact of fundamental TPS done thoroughly in a manufacturing environment in production lines and suppliers. I've been able to do it in the distribution and technical support functions in my divisional responsibility, but I had completely failed to influence the dealer network to implement even the simplest of the strategies. My conclusion was that there are some things you can only do from inside. It is only the people who have the unilateral control who can make the decision to redistribute that control. As an OEM, you do have a measure of power over some suppliers, but not so much over your retail franchise holders. I don't believe you can affect this kind of cultural change from the outside, least of all, dare I say it, as a consultant. The halfway I joined in 2011 is a collection of over 35 companies, all related to the motor industry. It's owned by George Bakey and his partner, the CFO, Rob Newton, 
It has a turnover of more than 3 billion rand, or roughly 170 million pounds sterling, and 1,100 employees. George characterizes it as a gathering of independence rather than a dealer group. It's a family business, and at Halfway we do extreme family. All of us on the executive level have children working in the business. In some cases, all our children work in the business. At its core are nine Toyota, one Lexus, and two Hino dealerships. Four GWM, Tata, and recently Nissan take the total to 20 dealerships. Their rental operations, uh, fuel outlets, insurance, panel shops, you would probably know as body and paint, and assorted fitment operations making up the balance. In total, over 6,000 new vehicles are sold, some from dealerships that look like this, that can fit 80 cars on their floor, others from dealerships that look like this, that can fit three cars on. They have workshops that look like this, and workshops that look like this. In 2014, the structure now looks like this, with 1,424 employees. It's a fast-grain concern with three more dealerships in various stages of development as we speak. It remains unlisted and wholly owned by the two partners. Given that George is already well in his 60s, it can be asked, what is the purpose of this growth? And how long before they cash in and sell to the corporatized dealer groups? I'll tell you what George told me in 2011. I want Halfway to continue after me to provide employment for our kids. Not just my kids, but all our kids and all our employees. The continued sustained success of Halfway is vital to their future prosperity. In the context of the unemployment challenge in our national economy, this is a far larger goal than the next quarter's targets. The work we have done has been limited to the 18 companies shown here in red. The hypothesis we were testing is that dealers can reap the benefits of Lean 2. From those erudite authors, Brunt and Kiff, they claimed that you can, dealers could double their throughput, doubling their profitability at least, while sustaining customer satisfaction, fulfillment, and loyalty. Really? Let's have a look at the results we had since 2011. George was much taken by Art Byrne's talk at this conference last year, the dramatic impact of turnaround efforts and the cellular improvements in all sorts of measures. So lightheartedly, we talk, we talk of the Art Byrne numbers whenever we have great improvements. Bear in mind also that this is over a period of a market that's been going sideways, so it's not a case of an incoming tide lifting all boats. We look at Ottery Profit, where we started in 2012, five, five-fold increase in four years. And Garmi Profit, we, which we acquired last year, we've had a doubling, doubling in profit since joining Halfway. Four-ways labor hours is up 50% to one of the highest in the highest nationally. Ottery Used Cars is a three-fold increase. Their production center turnover, more than three-fold increase. And we can look at Ellis's walk-in. He used to walk 2.4 kilometers for every car he serviced. He now walks 260 meters per service. On our green stream predictable work, if we look at the efficiency that we get in there, it's running at 267% with a 94% GP on labor. And fitting safety film, which took 90 minutes, is now down to 12 minutes. So we can also do the art burn numbers, and they always make shareholders happy. I'm a bit more cautious. I think measures like this often say as much about how bad you were as they say about how good you've become. Give me the modest 15% improvement every year. Every five years, you will double your output. And more importantly, you would have built the capability to keep doing it. And in 30 years, you'll be 6,000% bigger. So where do you start? Well, you start with yourself. I started with my own HK, and my overall goal was to develop 1,067 problem solvers. The overall strategy was agreed, outlining purpose, process, and people, and highlighting the values and goals. We started 
by trying to build alignment. At a monthly gathering of DPs, we would look at a 20-box matrix for each of the dealerships, volume, margin, cost, and quality for each of the five departments on a red-green basis. It was just a question of getting used to seeing the same picture and discussing the actual versus target over time, talking about the gaps. It also got people used to stand-up meetings. Customer fulfillment, as distinct from customer satisfaction, was introduced as a major KPI. The choice was either to spread the effort across the group to get take-up, or to concentrate on a few and make progress and create a credible example. Like most things, they tend to take their own path, and we ended up with a hybrid or organic approach. On the basis that I'll only work with the willing, we spent more time where the take-up was greatest. At this stage, we have more than enough of the willing not to exhaust ourselves on the less willing. What we were trying to do was to create alignment around the new approach. The outcome we want is, is depicted in this picture. Visualization of the result KPIs helped, and we gradually came to understand the process KPIs which drive the result. The whole process of visualizing results and printing them big enough to be read on the wall is, as one DP put it, very revealing. To kickstart the transformation, we did spend time on engagement with the staff. Using a process of dialogue based on the work of David Brom, it involved talking to people, all the people, giving them a voice, and more importantly, an opportunity to tell their own story. These discussions move on to values and aspirations as we highlight the things that bind us together. These sessions can get intensive and emotional as the sharing gets raw and authentic. But in the context of where we have come from as a society in South Africa, it has a powerful impact on giving people back their sense of dignity and helping us understand each other. It broke the silence around our history. It may be that we only really get transformation when there's a strong emotional component. I think I'm of that school. We move on to the harder business goals and get very specific on targets and desired outcomes. As Margaret Wheatley warns us, involvement is the key to transformation. The sessions also clearly signaled a change in approach and style, a move towards the cultural shift Peter Senge highlighted earlier. It was important to break the paradigm of the traditional hierarchical control. We did not use this process in all the companies we worked with, but where we did, it had a very dramatic impact. How lasting the impact is is determined by the behavior of the leadership and the consistency shown. You can't fake sincerity, and you'll always be found out if you try to fake it. We always start work in the service department of the dealership. It's the most factory-like part. The work cycles are relatively short, and you get a chance for repetition. And the work is visible on the shop floor. We find it the easiest place to introduce the concepts and to practice using the tools. It also helps that the people in after sales are often by nature more structured and disciplined in their approach to their work than many of their vehicle sales colleagues. The customer value we aim for is uninterrupted mobility, delivering right first time quality on time every time. We start by separating the work into predictable and unpredictable, and then organizing the predictable work in a flow to move one unit at a time. Typically, we find half the number of vehicles coming into the service center can fall into the predictable category. With some additional effort, this fraction can be pushed closer to the three-quarter mark. Studying the work methods, the work and the methods used to identify and eliminate waste starts around the hoist. It is detailed and painstaking work. It happens at the most basic level of movement and the availability of resources and components by the second, by the meter. Putting two people to work on a vehicle and sequencing their work so that they only do the necessary and value-adding tasks and have a standard way of doing every task has cut the time taken dramatically. The measure we use is by taking the OEM allowed flat rate, that's the time you're allowed to charge for, and dividing it by the actual time taken. We typically get efficiencies around 
and this is in an area where 120% is considered very good performance. The improvements in quality come as a bonus. It has proved to be our most valuable training ground for moving to a new way of thinking. It showed us the value of the team leader position and the importance of measuring at the bay and the benefit of quick response to the problems identified by the frontline workers. It also gave credence to the genuine involvement of the staff and built their confidence as they contributed to the countermeasures. Key things like using a headlamp to freeze hands. And if you're going to use two people walking under a lift, choose two that are the same height. It makes life more comfortable for both. Why are these things only obvious once they've been done? At its most mature, it enables dealers to offer a completely new product, what we call fixed time service. For routine maintenance, we can guarantee a turnaround time and work to a book schedule of half hour fixed time slots. The standard work is completed in 23 minutes, leaving time to deal with a small additional work that may be found like replacement of globes, wipers and brakes. This gives a throughput of 16 jobs per day, usually around 20 hours of paid work. The industry norm would be five jobs per day per lift with 10 hours of sold labor. The concept of service while you wait has not been done successfully in franchise dealers in South Africa before. The impact and attractiveness in our market can be seen from the distance customers are prepared to travel to make use of this facility and the subsequent increase in the hours sold per day. Physically, we could, have not, we could not have managed this number of vehicles on our site before creating flow. The constraints of parking and moving would have constipated the process to such an extent nothing would have come out, let alone on time. The next level is to expose the process more to the customer. In this facility, the Green Bay has been moved to what was showroom space right at the entrance to the dealership. The nature of the customer interaction is totally different as we strive to be easy to do business with. Keeping the customer on the premises also has benefits in eliminating time for communication and go-ahead on additional work. Even where we have not reached the fixed appointment stage, the increase in reliability and throughput has made dramatic contributions. On one site, they were faced with a sudden huge increase in demand from their most important customer. The DP credits the Green Bay performance as being the difference between demise and survival of her sanity, if not the whole business. To make the work flow, we have made the work visible, made the process visible, made the progress visible, made the problems visible, and made the measures visible. Once you do that, you can work to tech and resource to meet the tech. If you are predictable, you can get synchronization with other areas and speed up the flow even more. If you are unpredictable, then I will buffer against your unreliability and the whole process goes into a vicious cycle of deteriorating performance. All vehicles that get service in South Africa are washed before handover to the customer. It's the most visible part of the service and has a very direct impact on the customer perception of quality and reliability. So to make work flow, we also had to get it right in the wash bay. I confess I've long been obsessed with wash bays. In my years at Toyota, I've seen far too many examples of dealerships who have allowed the congestion in the wash bay to determine their workshop loading, as service advisors put pressure on booking clerks to cut back on bookings, as cars are always late out of the wash and a cause of great irritation and conflict with customers. Irrationally, it's also the area that dealer management is quickest to outsource, so they take their most serious constraint and hand over responsibility to an outsider who has little alignment with their objectives. To provide a reliable while you wait service, we needed the wash bay to work to the same tact as the technicians in the green bay. And because the wash bay needed to service the entire dealership, new and used cars as well as the service center, the sequence of work and visual controls were critical. Wash bay is an entry level job and you cannot always take functional literacy for granted. We spent a lot of time developing the training material to support the work change method. What emerged was a comic book approach to show an overview of the detailed standard work and the sequence of the work. And Harfi was born. He was subsequently joined by Halfina as women do most of the work in the drying and the interior bay. 
and later got promoted to work as a technician on the lifts to explain the sequence of work and provide the answer to all those whys. To keep the concept of time and the elapse of time relative to work required, we needed more than funny German words. The time box has a physical start and an end. And in the morning, the workshop controller gives the wash bay supervisor the physical number of cars that are required for the day. The plan is divided into half hours, and the planning of the balance between Green Bay vehicles and other vehicles is shown. This is what a good day looks like as the timeline is moved through the day. This is not such a good day. It is clear there is not enough time to wash the remaining vehicles, and help is needed. This is often an indication that vehicles have been slow out the workshop. The key issue is the situation is visible to everyone, and the trigger for action is clear. To increase the proportion of work that can be made predictable, we have been working on a pre-diagnosis process for more complex work. While seemingly duplication and waste, the process concentrates on identifying all the work required, not completing it. The necessary authority to go ahead with the work and the sourcing of the parts can then take place while the vehicle is in a holding area between lifts. The vehicle then only moves on to a lift when another technician, usually with a lower qualification, can execute all the work that has been authorized without interruption. It improves the visual control as stagnation on lifts becomes very apparent and can be dealt with. The most exper experienced technicians do the most challenging diagnostic work and feed a number of junior technicians, and we keep the hands on the cars to support people. The support people can synchronize their efforts to keep the techs doing chargeable work. So far, the results have been encouraging, and we are able to add about 20% more work to the predictable stream. And even accounting for both the pre-diagnosis and the repair time, we get in efficiencies of 170%, with an even greater impact on gross profit and quality as the most appropriate skills are used for the right work. One of the biggest hurdles we have faced here is the way, traditional way we measure and pay technicians. It's only taking root where we tackle the time save bonus way of paying people. You develop the visualization you need as you need it. Here's a view of a workshop control room where the inflow of work from government departments is high, the work extensive, it sometimes borders more on refurbishment than repair, and the administrative process around quotes, authorization, orders, and invoicing is complex and tedious. The daily update of the information between the five different areas involved keeps the progress visible and provides input for the planning of the next stage of the process. Some of the technology is really dated. This is Machosi's abacus. It was built by the welder with rods and nuts, and it's the fastest, most effective way of workshop planning I have seen. Vehicle preparation was approached in much the same way. Getting new vehicles ready for the showroom or delivery has a standard process you can define and execute in a standard way. Again, it requires the coordination of various players, and the visualization of the progress helps eliminate the stagnation in the flow. Delivered on time has not been an easy concept for salespeople to get their head around, but at least we have made progress with ready on time. The steps are the same. Define the process, set the target, measure the actual versus target, focus on the gaps, and develop and implement the countermeasures to eliminate the gaps. Note that the slides are always updated by hand, in the presence of the team, by the person responsible for doing the work. The closer to the place of work, the better. Creating visual controls by having the discipline to only work in a set sequence, in a set place, like only delivering from a designated delivery bay, helps highlight the deviation from standard and can act as an end-on to stop the process and give you a chance to fix the problem. Some of our most significant work has been done in the predict production center at Ottery, where they have taken standard work and working to tack to a level I think is the equal of any I've seen on a Toyota production line. All the staff at the production center have progressed from starting in the wash bay, and there is a respect and a dignity in the work at all levels that has to be seen to be appreciated. The performance of this area played a significant part in this to support the growth of this dealership. They work from very space-constrained premises, and the effectiveness of what they have done 
enables them to sell 200 vehicles a month from a site and achieve a utilization of four square meters per car versus an industry norm of 20 square meters per car delivered. I dread the day we are forced to move to premises that are big enough, as I fear the mother of the inventiveness will be lost. Used vehicles benefit even more from the synchronization of cross-functional efforts. The requirements are more complex and can involve more time. Again, the fundamental point lies in establishing and agreeing a consistent standard, defining what constitutes an acceptable level of used in a car, by age, by zone on the car, by functional feature. It makes it possible to define the work required on each car and possible for the work to be delivered to that standard consistency in a defined time. This gets beyond the, no, the customer will accept that subjective debate. Used sales has long been our most underperforming area in the halfway operation, and the implementation of standards and standard work is starting to make a difference to the confidence the salespeople have in the product and the confidence the customers have in dealing with us. One of our biggest opportunities is to leverage the car rental operations we run, to provide quality used vehicles in sync with market demand, establishing the standards and dramatically reducing the preparation time by selling dealers showroom ready cars has already had a positive impact on both the rental companies and the dealerships. And as they say in the classics, you ain't seen nothing yet. But a, a return on assets running over 30% in the rental game is an encouraging start. Vehicle sales is the holy grail of our transformation efforts. If we don't succeed in this area, little of what we've done will retain credibility, and we will not have proved that TPS can work at retail. This is an area that has always been dominated by the street fighter, the experienced wheeler dealer who can nail the sale, a practitioner of dark arts who pulls the rabbit out the hat in the last two days of the month. That view of the art of selling is entrenched in many places, even still in our own organization. Myself, I think it's often more akin to a clerical process, driven by the relative custard demand and OEM supply, and a race to the bottom in the discount war between the same franchise dealers who live for the incentives that increment exponentially when an, the arbitrary volume targets are reached. Again, our initial work was focused in the back office support rather than the selling process itself. The information gathering, the journey of the dreaded deal file, the interface with finance and insurance all presented opportunities for eliminating duplication and delays by simplifying and combining work and just defining what the best process is. Sometimes it was as easy as changing the position of a printer. We had a classic example where the accountant saved 0.7 of a cent per page printed and generated 56 kilometers of walking by the sales staff per month by centralizing to a faster, cheaper to run printer. Other times it was more difficult as we grappled with the age old issue of who owns the customer. The salesperson and the dealership are just two of a number of comp competing claimants. Sales come as a result of activities. Keeping track of the activities of the salesperson, the volume and the thoroughness of the effectiveness is a large part of the sales management job. The daily visualization of the progress of all deals and near deals made a big difference to management's understanding of where they are. The work in sales is much more difficult to see. The cycle times are much longer and the off, than in the after sales area and just going through the steps to get agreement on what a complete and accurate deal file would look like can test the patience of Job. We did make good progress in some areas by trying to initiate the customer contact. The mobile showroom idea, where we take the vehicles to the shopping malls where the people are, not for display, but for initiating and concluding the full deal on the spot, has worked very well for the Ottery dealership but we've been unable to replicate the success in other branches. Our farming experiment of using known data about existing clients to source and compile a compelling offer based on cost to change has been successful, but not extensive enough to deliver the potential I believe it has. It was out of sheer frustration at not being able to overcome the reluctance of sales staff to stick to process and conform to a disciplined standard work sequence that led us to the Kirsten experiment. This is our lab rat, Kirsten Wallace. 
She's an industrial engineer honors graduate with several years consulting experience in manufacturing and assembly environments. She joined us to get line management experience and worked in our body and paint areas first. She knew nothing about selling or sales or for that matter much about motor vehicles. But she had a deep understanding and appreciation for process and flow. It also helps that she's a compulsive overachiever. We put her onto the sales floor to sell vehicles. She spent the first three months learning about the product and doing the first level sales training required by Toyota South Africa and getting basic exposure to the systems that, as they existed. The hypothesis we were testing was that selling has a standard process and standard skills needed to qualify customers, present to them, handle their objections and close the deal. With product knowledge and genuine activity and by adhering to standard practice, you will get sales. In the following three months, Kirsten sold 29 vehicles. The performance put her in the top 5% of salespeople in our group in both unit and profit terms. Hypothesis confirmed, I think. No dark secrets, no years of experience, no street brawling, just the discipline to stick to the process and genuine efforts to keep consistently high levels of activity. Hell, she even started getting high junkie in sales. There are still skeptics who contend I was just lucky and I chose a natural salesperson. But it did help change minds in how we measure and visualize the sales activity levels. The funnels are used to highlight what has been done and what still needs to be done. It also identifies at what stage the potential deal leaks from the system. It gives a basis for coaching and maybe readjusting focus. As it keeps developing and is modified by adding more detail, the interface between the sales manager and the salesperson becomes more meaningful and more truthful. Our next experiment is to try and replicate these results on a wider scale. Kirsten has been moved to an underperforming branch in a team leader role in sales. We were also encouraged to move other people with strong process orientation from after sales into sales management positions. Progress has been a lot slower here, mostly because in my rush, I ignored my, all the earlier comments I made about involvement and co-creation. Stupidly, I assumed that showing salespeople a standard way that gives results and enables them to make more money would be motivation enough to get them to change behavior. Not so. As money-driven as they are, there are a lot of defense mechanisms that kick in to resist when you neglect the alignment stage. And it is often only by its absence that you see the value of a thing. So we have to go back, fill in the skipped steps, and build the foundation from the middle out. There are enough individual wins to be encouraged, but not the rapid take-up I had hoped for. Used sales follow a similar process, making the activity visible, making the progress of the deal visible, and identifying the leaks in the process. Here, just defining the desired profile for the market made targeting of specific units for trading more successful. Consistent supply of quality used vehicles from the rental operations is encouraging the, pay, the salespeople to pre-sell in the confidence that the vehicle will arrive to standard on time. With this, the velocity and turn is improving and the stock carrying cost is heading in the right direction. I want to use the remaining time to look at the lessons we have learnt and what we know we have not got right and conclude with the measures. The solution will depend on the situation. The situation determines the outcome. There are common principles and even a standard sequence and a process, but the detail in the design and the implementation is always responsive to the specifics of the situation. It has to be. If the implementation is dependent on the people, then it must respond when the people are different. It follows then that there can be no rollout. This is not something you can perfect on one site and then package for implementation and with some cursory train the trainer efforts spread throughout a network and hope for sustainable results. The best you can hope for is that you will learn, that others learn and can keep learning and that by having an example and exposing people to it, you can fan their keenness to learn and prepare for the next intervention and experiment cycle. 
How hopeless then the task of the national sales company trying to drive a rollout of process change with software packages and regional staff measured on completed visits. It all hinges on alignment. Top to bottom, they are all necessary, but on their own, none is sufficient. We don't succeed everywhere, but there is a critical mass that changes the take-up rate, and momentum does build with each success. The role of the team leader is pivotal. We've struggled with this more than any other area. What is the role? What are the responsibilities? How does it fit into the tr traditional hierarchy? Not all of this is clear to us yet, but it's very much the team leader's role to protect standard work and to ensure that the progress of the work is maintained. They are close to the front line, close enough to step in and help to get the progress back to standard. They are available to make decisions and provide coordination as needed. They are the first line of support in the, en in the event of a team me member being absent. They see the process all the time. Don't take them away from the front line other than for the Asakai. More than anyone else, they are your guardian of quality and best positioned to encourage the continuous improvement we all strive for. People surprise you. Don't imagine your blueprint will survive the first engagement with the front line. If your alignment is right and you have consensus on what is customer value and your own principles the values you can and the values, then you can set free the creativity and enthusiasm of your team. You will be amazed. It all lies in your own ability to relinquish the unilateral control on decision making that we were all raised to cherish. This means that the leader at all levels has to change. The questions they ask, the places they walk, the tone of voice they use, the way they respond to problems, all needs to change to be consistent with a new paradigm rooted in respect for people and the contribution they can make. Consistency is everything. Standard work is fundamental. If you haven't got standard work, you haven't started yet. No standard, no gap. No gap, no problem. No problem, no improvement. No problem is a problem. If you don't have one, go and make one. All progress comes from solving problems. Make it visible. By now, you should have an idea of how dependent we are on the power of visualization. For as long as we work in teams and need collective efforts to meet the customer needs, visualization will remain critical. It helps us see the same problem and we can agree on the nature of the problem before we get to defend our pet solution. Visualization is to help grasp the situation and understand what's really happening. It's not an end in itself because measuring is somehow intrinsically good. We learn by doing. You have to do in order to learn. Try the countermeasure now. Even if it's ineffective, you will still have learnt in the process. It's detail, it's hard to keep going. It requires a level of discipline not common in white collar work. That is why I have such admiration for our teams in the wash bays and the technical functions. They are far more consistent in their practice and adherence to standard than a lot of their more sophisticated, more educated and higher paid colleagues. It has to be routine. If you can make it routine, you will do it. If not, there will be little progress from sporadic efforts. Like brushing your teeth only contributes to dental hygiene if done every day. Standard work will only contribute to safety, quality and delivery if done every day. Cost and profit will follow as outcomes. We need the hygiene factor of relentless adherence to standard work, the visual man management and the identification of gaps, analysis and implementation of countermeasures to drive the development of our people as problem solvers. Problem solving is the fundamental skill you have to nurture. Your future depends on it. It takes longer than you think. It's a long, long road and we need to learn to travel light and appreciate the journey as we go. And patience is fatal and often sends us backwards. Take encouragement from the growth you see in people. People who learn the satisfaction of taking control and making a difference and the dignity that comes from work well done 
and recognized as such is a constant encouragement to me. We have no lean team. The work is done in the line function, so we have no issues with integration of the changes once they've been worked out. But we do have to then deal with interruptions. Customers keep getting in the way. We are too busy to improve, and we can lose our way as we keep having to respond to the urgent and lose sight of the important. We need to fly this plane while we are building it, or keep building it while we are flying it. Consistency of purpose is the responsibility of the leaders. The best results are coming from the operations that are successfully crossing functional boundaries. This too is largely a matter of leadership. The best are able to break the silos and keep focus on the customer and our efforts to deliver the most value to our customers while consuming fewer resources and using the talents of our people who do the work. What have we not done well? We're not initiating the transactions, not in any meaningful way. We're still too dependent on customers deciding to come to us and not using our skills and information to approach them with a compelling offer. We're therefore making limited progress with Hijunka, and this remains our next frontier. We have not tackled the booking seriously. We know we need to improve the quality of customer interaction at the booking stage, and we know that putting higher skilled people in this job will give us an improvement in the amount of predictable work flowing in. We haven't done it anywhere yet. The link from measurement to problem solving is not established. Our PDCA process in the Asakai is immature. We only really have one good example where we're getting a clear cascade from measurement to tallying problems to identification of the most important problem to work on to the development of the countermeasure and the implementation and the tracking of these countermeasures on a daily basis. We're struggling to make headway in vehicle sales area. With one notable exception, the results have been slow to realize. We're struggling to get adherence to standard work on a broad basis. There's much more to be done on our management Hoshan process and developing the standard work of leaders, and especially myself and the dealer principals. At this stage, too little is routine, and so too little gets done. We cannot say we have a plan for every car, a plan for every customer, and a plan for every team member. The best we can say is we have the beginnings of a plan to develop these plans. So how then do we evaluate these last three years? What's the real measure? To start, I think we must recognize the difference between Art Byrne's purpose and Halfway's purpose. Art, Art Byrne buys underperforming companies with the intention of turning around performance and selling them again for profit. The interventionist model driven by turnaround specialists makes sense when you are aiming for a quick turn and profit on the sale. Halfway's purpose is to provide sustainable prosperity for our employees and the children of our employees. Profit and growth are vital for the continued prosperity, not for the sale of the asset. Perhaps the analogy I can use is the difference between flipping a company in three years and planting a church. This venerable Victorian gentleman is Robert Moffat of the London Missionary Society. In 1921, he journeyed from his native Scotland to start a mission station in Kuruman on the edge of the Kalahari Desert and way beyond the colonial boundaries of the time. It took him 10 years to build the first school and have the first family of converts, and another nine years passed until they built the church. But at the 175th anniversary of that Kuruman Mission Church last year, the congregation and adherents numbered in tens of thousands. The purpose of the mission was to evangelize and convert and transform lives to lead to salvation. Measured in any of the 50 years of his life at Kuruman, Robert Moffat's success would have been judged as paltry. In terms of the realization of his purpose, we would now judge his impact as art burnish. I look for our measure of success in the impact it's had on the life of our staff. This is Karim. Karim was a street hawker selling samosas to try and make a living. He's now a qualified artisan with extensive skills and owns his own home. Sean is a sales executive. He's resolved his debt problems and moved from this house to this house. Gertrude is a single mother with a basic education, and she grew up in the impoverished area of the Eastern Cape. 
but she has a customer network second to none and is often our, most, our top salesperson. This is her daughter starting her first day at the University of Cape Town. You cannot imagine how different Keswe's life experience is going to be from that of her mother's. My good friend Alex, and yes, he is as rough as he looks. He was able to fund his wife's full-time studies and she recently qualified as a nurse. Webster was unemployed and unemployable. He lived in a shack in Kailitsha. He started in the production center Wash Bay and he's now the team leader in our safety fitment film operation and he owns his own home. Haley is upgrading the lifestyle of her family in ways that were unimaginable to her parents. There are more than six employees who've been able to move their children out of the drug-ridden, gangster-dominated ghetto schools into suburban schools where they can get a decent education. This is Carmen. She's 18 years old and in her first formal employment. She's also four foot nine inches tall. On her first day of work in the valet section she joined, she was able to show her team a totally different way of cleaning windscreens, which is faster, more effective, and saves the back pain they previously suffered. She's a natural lean thinker, and it helps when you can stand up inside the car. <laughs> On that basis, and using a Robert Moffat time scale, I think we've been successful. Is it sustainable? Will it continue to meet Halfway's purpose? Again, I look to the team and the development of people. If I stop tomorrow, if Dave Brunt never came to South Africa again, these are the people I believe are converts who will keep practicing their lean thinking. They've been infected and believe and will carry on even in different environments without any outside support. There are another 50 people who will also keep experimenting if these first 21 keep carrying on. This is why I believe the road we have chosen, the road less traveled, will make all the difference. It is in their hearts, and they can take on whatever the market may throw at them. Margaret Mead is credited with saying, never underestimate the power of a small group of committed people to change the world. Indeed, it is the only thing that ever has. There just comes a time where you have to commit and take the first step out the boat. Each of us have to do it on our own, with our own convictions. But you have to take the first step for the sake of our kids. Thank you.